humbling introduction. So, I'd like to say we miss your mother. And in case I don't have time at the end, I'd uh, just like to read this poem to you. Echoes. There is a timber of voice that comes from not being heard and knowing you are not being heard. Noticed only by others, not heard for the same reason. The flavor of midnight fruit, tongue calling your body through dark light, piercing the allure of safety, ripping the glitter of silence around you. Dazzle me with color, and perhaps I won't notice till after you're gone your hot grain smell tattooed into each new poem, resonant beyond escape. I am listening in that fine space between desire and always. The grave stillness before choice. As my tongue unravels, in what pitch will the scream hang unsung or shiver like lace on the borders of never? Recording which dreams heal, which dreams can kill. Stabbing a man and burning his body for cover. Being caught making love to a woman. I do not know. I'd like to thank Jim Wilson and the Clegg's board for inviting me. Needless to say, I'm deeply honored and a little surprised to be here, nervous too. I was a member of uh, a member and a co-chair of CLEGS from 1990 to 1992. I had good times as a board member and as I said co-chair with Esther Katz and working with Marty Duberman and was involved in many good programs. I remember one year when Adrian Rich and Alice Walker agreed to serve as honorific co-chairs of our annual fundraiser. And Alice Walker happened to be in the city at the time of the event and wanted to attend. So, so Esther Katz and I had the honor of picking up Ms. Walker and her friend historian Robert L. Allen and escorting them to the Graduate Center in uh, was across the street from the library. So that was one of many good times we had at Clegg's, and I, I'm happy to see you're still going strong. As many of you in the audience know, or even if you don't, <laughs> uh, I have been honored asked to give celebratory addresses to students and colleagues, was given a fabulous retirement party in June by my beloved Rutgers colleagues, got a lot of nice gifts, <laughs> really nice, <laughs> um, and I received a wonderful celebration of my work. Uh, on the Livingston campus at Rutgers in October, which was organized and convened uh, by a hardworking group of younger black queer troublemakers. Um, Darnell Moore, Stephen Poolwood, Alexis Pauline Gums, and Mecca J. Sullivan. And now, tonight, here at CLAGS, at the CUNY Graduate Center. 
Uh, I gave my talk the title Black Queer Trouble in, <laughs> in Life, Literature, and the Age of Obama. So I could practically talk about anything. <laughs> in the black, queer, lesbian, gay, bi, trans world. But I won't talk about anything or it. And I'm going to begin before the age of Obama, almost <laughs> before he was born. One, my mother, she tells me that Johnny May will grow up to be a bad woman. But I say it's fine. I'd like to be a bad woman too. <laughs> and wear the gray stockings of night black lace and strut down the street with paint on my face. Two, I am an oversex, well-hung black queen influenced by phrases like, I am the love that dare not speak its name. Mm -hmm. And you want me to sing, we shall overcome? <laughs> Do you, daddy, daddy? Do you want me to coo for your approval? Three, pass through me, dark to light, wash over me with rivers of joy, embrace me with your love, if I'll have you, but no, I'm no one's for the taking. No, I am not even mine for the taking. For I am a mannish dyke, muff diver, bull dagger, butch feminist, femme, and proud. Uh, Gwen Brooks is bad woman. Number one, two, Essex Hemp Hills over six, well on Queen. Three, Samia Bashir's speaking clitoris. And four, an anonymous political poster, the Manish Dyke, Muff Diver. Bull Dagger, Butch Feminist Fem, and Proud ought to be enough to cause some black queer trouble in here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> one starts to ponder what one has contributed and where and its future, and was it progressive, reformer, reformist, reactionary, in the service of institutional politics, in service beyond the boundaries of the institution, transformative, radical, or even revolutionary. What are the limits of one's allegiance, of feminist commitments, of risk, of courage, of the politics of black of erotic choices. In the summer of 1967, auditing Arthur P. Davis's course, Negro Literature in the U.S. at Howard University, I learned for the first time about black literary practice from Phyllis Wheatley to Leroy Jones. I learned that the reading of so-called Negro literature had been a primary means of communicating social injustices done unto black Americans. African American literature became a metonym representing global oppression and resistance of third world people. South African writer Peter Abrahams is inspired to write by reading Du Bois, Cullen, Hugh, Wright, 
claiming in his memoir, Tell Freedom, that their writings gave him a new vision of his own country, which he left in 1957. My sense and experience of writing as an explicator of the absence of social justice emboldened me to emulate the dictates of the black arts movement and to write poetry. Having attained an R, see this doesn't resist the autobiographical, mm -hmm. having attained an R and B and black arts sensibility, I set out from Washington, D.C. in 1969. I had read Frazier's Black Bourgeoisie, Alex Haley's autobiography of Malcolm X, Fanon's Black Skins, White Man's, Ab Tecker's The Documentary History of the Negro American, and Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God. Why, what else would you need? <laughs> I landed in New Brunswick on the Rutgers campus, met by the ballyhoo of a full gamut of political demonstrations by students and faculty. Anti-war, black power, women's liberation, gay liberation, and the kindness of, shall we say, strangers, all in jeans and t-shirts. Meanwhile, I was wearing an A-line dress and stockings. <laughs> <laughs> Quicksand and passing, 
Hortense Spillers interstices, a small drama of words, Claudia Tate's ethnography, black women writers at work, Mary Helen Washington's Black Eyed Susan, Jewel Gomez's A Cultural Legacy Denied and Discovered Black Lesbians in Fiction by Women, Cheryl Walls edited Changing Our Own Words, Essays on Criticism Theory and Writing by Black Women, Gloria Hall's article Under the Days, The Barren Life and Poetry of Angelina Well Grimke, Beverly Guy Sheftel's 30 Black Bridges and Words of Fire. Writers and writing became the chief arbiters of a transformation of consciousness, intellectual, political, emotional, which is ongoing. Not merely instrumental, the novels, poems, plays, essays of underwriting women, underrepresented women writers and cultural readings and public events, journals and anthologies became pedagogical and theoretical and critical guides by which to live. In her foreword to this bridge called My Back, Writings by Radical Women of Color, the late Tony K. Bambara charged us, the writers and editors of that enduring anthology, to quote, make revolution irresistible. We know revolution is protracted, and so is a progressive agenda. Witness how accusatory people became about Obama's inaugural speech. Liberal, progressive. And we said to Obama, hey bro, it's about time at least be liberal, progressive. <laughs> <laughs> we also say deeds, not words. And I suppose supporting same-sex marriage, getting rid of DOMA, getting rid of don't ask, don't tell, refusing to sell women's reproductive rights totally down the hole, is liberal, progressive, but not enough. <laughs> here, here. This talk will attempt to speak to black queer spaces of resistance and desire, and black queer trouble, and black feminist trouble, too. I am taking black queer trouble from Alexis Pauline Gums, a queer black feminist writer, poet, educator, online troublemaker, and founder of the Eternal Summer Black Feminist Mind, a virtual school of black feminism. Here Gums defines the learning outcomes of her free online course entitled, quote, to be a problem, outcast subjectivity and black literary production. We will explore troublemaking, radical performative critique, and the transgressive and embattled act of visual, textual, sonic, and multimedia publishing as possible responses to systemic and individual exclusions. If publishing is an act of stolen power for outcasts, this class will be a publication of what it can mean to be problematic in a society inflected by race, class, sexuality, and gender norms. Our aim is not to solve the problems of classism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia as inflected by race, but rather to create a space where it is possible to act, speak, write, and think otherwise anyway. <laughs> I say take that, University of Phoenix. <laughs> Can I, as a black queer troublemaker and feminist too, operationalize revolution and or progressive 
agendas? Can I trouble the liberal same-sex status quo enough to say it's not enough? Can I trouble LGBT communities to feed our hungry youth, both physically and emotionally, in ways relatives and neighbors can or don't or won't? Can I trouble our LGBT? Can I trouble our white LGBT allies to continue to challenge white domination within their organizations and to share the resources you have attained because of your white privilege. As I have become more assimilable, can I trouble the carceral state by advocating for and with survivors of it? by refusing unnecessary police presence in my gentrifying and gentrified neighborhoods, and by demanding professional police behavior wherever I am and they are? Can I trouble my communities of color enough to counter their homophobia and sexism and black straight respectability? What account do I give myself in the context of the scourge of HIV AIDS among the most vulnerable people in my communities? Stephen G. Fullwood, in his piece, The Low Down on the Down Low, calls for accountability on the individual and group level in the black community in chilling terms. If a man is on the DL, that's his business. If he spends his time out having unprotected sex with men or women, contracting venereal diseases and bringing them home to his girlfriend, wife, or male lover, then that's another story. That's an issue of honesty, not sexuality, or to the point, homosexuality. If we can't talk to each other across perceived sexual boundaries, the walls of ignorance will just get higher. Mm. Ignorance will continue to be passed down from generation to generation, and perhaps, worst of all, after the dust has cleared, Nobody will be left to talk about anything. Can I sustain the trouble? Is it enough to trouble in increments? Am I about changing myself, the courses of events, structural power, eradicating the carceral state, inequities of race, gender, sex, politics, material resources, money, and the harsh domination of immigrants and the working classes of the world. I turn to my sister of the plantain and the corn, Sheree Moraga, as she defines her feminist politics in the context of her hedonism, her Mexican native ancestry, and the frailty or strength of coalitional politics. We make and break political alliance as we continue to evolve and redefine what is our work in this life. As a Hikana, I find the deepest resonance in that evolutionary process with my sisters of the corn, as Tony K. Bambara called Native women. Indianism, North and South, gives shape to the values with which I raise my children. It informs my feminism, my sense of Lugar on this planet in relation to its creatures, minerals, and plant life. Ideally, it is a philosophy, not of rigid separatism, but of cultural autonomy and communitarian reciprocity.
atrocity in the 21st century is my sure-footed step along that open road of alliance with my sisters of the rice, the plantain, and the yam. What rituals, legacies, praxis give shape to our values? What does it mean to be still inspired by the black arts movement? To still believe the lessons of the black arts movement became a large house of resistance to patriarchal culture, black and white and to still believe in Amiri Baraka's 1969 dictum about literary practice as expressed in the poem, Black Art. Poems are bullshit unless they are teeth or trees or lemons piled on a step. Fuck poems, and they are useful. <laughs> Which should come at you, love what you are, breathe like wrestlers, or shudder strangely after pissing. Mm -hmm. Our work and our writing as black queer troublemakers <coughs> are fraught with disobedience, resistance, and direct language. In these lines from her poem, Star Apple, Alexis gums <coughs> queries us <laughs> how to tuck home into cleavage and bring it out flower magic how dare we be free all out loud and in public and shit <laughs> disobeying our pension for black respectability something we crave even as black queers Essex Hemphill also faces off black macho culture by asserting a phallocentric masculinity. In America, I place my ring on your cock where it belongs. I remain convinced that there is no transformation unless black feminists and black queers saying gender loving in the life communities engage in a kind of itinerant movement from front to back to inside to outside again and again and unless there are parallel movements going and coming in the streets, down the alley and in the house whereby dynamic mutuality and exchange, coalesce, and contest. As Gloria Hall said of Audre Lorde's radical positionality of, quote, living on the line, we too have to live on the line between either or and both and, and engage in ceaseless negotiations of a, of a positionality from which we can speak, act, and make trouble, not settling, setting, or sitting still. A few words about lesbian feminism. Mm -hmm. Lesbian feminists did the work and the word. We took the potluck to new levels. <laughs> <laughs> Most nights of the week, on Saturday mornings, Sunday afternoons, at meetings and on projects, at fundraising events for those projects, at the proofreading and layout meeting, after an afternoon of wrapping and trips to the post office with scores of parcels among us and somebody's old VW or Corolla, the lesbian feminist theater group, the tickets, the box office, the folding chairs, the posters, the feeding of cast and crew, or the cultural center and cafe, its readings and public programs, the film set in someone's loft <laughs> with 20 volunteers on hand to make up, dress, direct, film, feed the cast and crew, 
the lesbian-led national conference on violence against women of color on a frayed shoestring budget and women from all over the country and the world come at their own expense and hours. The anti-apartheid publication celebration on an equally frayed budget under the aegis of a lesbian editorship, the all-volunteer lesbian health fair, or the weekend-long board planning retreat. <laughs> <laughs>
our relationship, quote, our relationship to feminism and our world is bound up with a proclivity for the percussive as we divorce ourselves from correct or hegemonic ways of being in favor of following the rhythm of our own heartbeats. In other words, what others may call audacious or crazy, we call crunk, because we are drunk off the heady theory of feminism that proclaims that another world is possible. We resist others' attempts to stifle our voices, acting belligerent when necessary, and getting buck when we have to. <laughs> crunk feminists don't take no mess from nobody. <laughs> Quite a change in tone from the rather distressed tone of Smith and Bethel, <laughs> and also different from Gums's more teacherly reserved tone. <laughs> the virtual anthology carries on the work of black feminist troublemakers. I started to say of your, then I realized I put my skin in. <laughs> Women's studies scholar and troublemaker Vivian May asserts in her article, Under Theorized and Understudied, an article on Harriet Tubman, a real revolutionary and if not queer, a definite black troublemaker, <laughs> that histories may states that histories of this noted icon of black women's resistance tend to portray her as a superhuman 19th century anomaly, separate and apart from the community of black women in resistance to slavery. Hmm. May further contends that were Tubman doing today what she was doing before emancipation, that is, armed resistance to slavery, leading someone's human chattel to freedom, ready to kill or be killed rather than be returned to slavery, which was still legal during the earlier part of her resistance. She would be considered a domestic terrorist. May continues to frame how we, quote, make over the radical facets and figures of black history in the image of black respectability. Tubman's historical makeover transforms her radical vision and resistance, and at times illegal actions, into benign symbols of progress and family values. This interpretive shift aligns her organized resistance to fit with narratives of the nation's deliverance from its past sins and to render a more tender portrait of the nation as a family. The salvific also reinforces problematic ideas about the state as an otherwise perfect system, with its central tragic flaw, slavery, and its tragically flawed central characters, white citizens, healed over thanks to Tubman, it's imperative to consider how deliver it is imperative to consider how deliverance models draw attention away from the tenacious nature of the systems of oppression Tubman fought against in her lifetime and how they persist to this day. They live on in new ways. And we as a nation are still not delivered from them. There is room, there is some room for comparison between Tubman and Asada Shakur. Similarly, Tubman was branded and, quote, illiterate and insolent abolitionist who, when she was enslaved, was always, quote, getting in the way, unquote, of slaves' discipline. $40,000 for Tubman's capture, dead or alive, or, quote, the sooner she is turned in, the better it will be for all Southerners. Asada has been cited by the FBI as a domestic terrorist with a 
$2 million award aided by the vaunted New Jersey State Troopers for a caption. For over 40 years, the U.S. has been trying to capture Assad, who was railroaded into life plus 30 imprisonment on very unclear evidence in 1977 that she murdered a New Jersey State Trooper. This continues to tell us that the systemic racist oppression of African Americans, primarily in the context of the carceral state, is not only, quote unquote, the new Jim Crow, but really a 21st century replication of slavery. Mm -hmm. Once a slave, you're a slave for life. Once a prisoner of the state, you are for life contained, constrained, and surveilled by the state. Blacks have no rights, whites are bound to respect. An ex-felon has no rights, a citizen is bound to respect. Stop and frisk, shoot your shot, stand your ground, take your best shot. Hmm. Asada continues to say that she is a warrior for black liberation. Angela Davis, herself not a stranger to wanted, uh, wanted posts. Angela Davis declaims, Asada is not a threat. If anything, this is a vendetta. And at least I can say, like Michael Denzel Smith in The Nation Online, hands off Asada now and forever. Mm. I flew in on the cusp of the Black Power Movement, but someone did not pay the bill, and here we are all left alone in our blackness. Black queer troublemakers, one of the more excluded and despised members of the black community in the United States, carry on the black power revolution's commitment to racial justice. And this in response to black, black drag artist Joe Mama Jones' comment above. I flew in on the cusp of the black power And so I will claim that, uh, I will claim that for black queers and for that unfinished revolution somewhere in Atlantic City when Ella Baker walked out on the 1964 Democratic National Convention after the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party was prevented from being seated as the real delegates to the convention, from, as the real delegates from the, to the convention. While we black queers were left alone in the dark, countering the sexual repression of the Nixon Mitchell, Raven Meese 1970s and 80s, black lesbian and gay writers appropriated that direct and aggressive expressivity of the black arts movement to continue black queer critiques of the ubiquitous racism of white America and the gender prescriptiveness and homophobia of conservative black communities. Most viscerally documented in its refusal to organize around the AIDS pandemic or anything else having to do with lesbian and gay rights. Here Jericho Brown reminds us, tell them Herman Finley is dead. Then tell them what God loves, the truth, the disease your mother's mouth won't mention. Black lesbians and gays enacted what Farrah J. Grisman, Griffin, I'm sorry, black lesbians and gays enacted what Farrah J. Griffin says of modern dance artist Pearl Primus in her portrayal 
of the Jim Crow car in the 1940s. Primus was able to embody a particularly black paradox, quote, forced confinement and forced mobility, unquote. Can't set too long and sometimes can't go too far or can't be afraid to come back or must, like Asada Shakur, never come back. We too worked within the constraints to break free of them. And I'll close with this last. Mecca J. Sullivan's short story, Wolf Pack, for the New Jersey Four, about the seven young black lesbians who were arrested, I think around 2006, in the West Village for defending themselves against a low-life street peddler exemplifies Griffin's metaphor of forced containment and forced mobility. Mm. A good story about the ways in which the press savaged young women is in The Public Intellectual in 2011, an online newspaper, and predisposed the court and the public to viewing them as the assailants rather than the victims. Sullivan's story is told from the perspective of four fictional young women who were sentenced from three and a half to 11 years in jail. Vernice, the character, one of the four, one of the fictional four, decides to make things whatever she wants them to be inside her prison cell. This story is perhaps a parable of places that could use some black queer troublemaking. Bernice, I am wrapped up in Luna, my girls, and the warm licorice sky. The man tears like a bullet through our night. Who asked you what you think, you goddamn elephant? So many things are going on in this moment. My skull loses its solidity and breaks down to mesh, to scream. I cannot tell what part of the action is happening inside. What out? I see a man in pink come. I see a woman run away. I see fingers in DVD cases and the nugget of firefly. I see blood curled around stripes and Shaw holding a silver-soaked blade. From one side of my ears or the other, I hear him say, God damn, God damn, God damn. I feel words popping like firecrackers inside my mouth and I let them blaze the air. You are not a man. Your sneakers are cheap. Your clothes are corny. You have no job. You are not a man. Hands on your sleepy little dick. You are not a man. What you know about God, some white man in the sky, if your God doesn't know me and my big black dyke man, woman, God fucking, he doesn't exist. You are not a man. You are a joke. My first night here, I make a decision. Pretend. I play games with myself. Games like my mother used to play. I pretend to fool myself. Things are not what they are. In some other place, in some far corner of possibility, things are right. Still, there is always the ink running like blood up and down the newsprint paper. Killer lesbian, tribe again. Seething, sapphic swarm to sin. Bloodthirsty pride attacks. When I can't tell the difference between inside and out, I decide. If I want to share my dinner with Anthony Jesus, I decide he's on my lap, his polka dot beard brushing my wrist. 
If I want to joke with Taran and Shaw, I decide they're on the cot with me, and we laugh. I wade through the sea of orange suits, eat my food, and do what I'm told. I try not to think in days how they close me up in darkness. I try not to think of how time is crusting over, baking me deeper into stillness each time the moon brings a day to its end. On the morning after my first night here, someone puts a newspaper in my hands. The paper is folded open. And before I read the headlines, I find my name in the middle column. I read up from there, waiting back. I see the name of the reporter and roll up to the headline, Lesbian Wolfpack Howls It's In. This is when I decide to make things whatever I want them to be. From the space around me, I carve my mother's smile and the deep, wet, warm sky. I get up, tighten my grip, part my lips like two heavy winds, and say out loud, let's go. So I finish. Mm -hmm. <laughs>